myself. But uh, we're going to try to end this, this uh, session with some spirit. And if I can't generate it for myself, I'm certainly going to come to you all. <laughs> okay. um, I want to thank you for coming out, uh, spending this hour or so with me. I don't take any of this for granted. Uh, I'm privileged to be in your company. Uh, it's very important to me. Thank you. I hope that uh, I'm able to uh, leave you all with something of value. Uh, this morning, I kind of went through a short biography, and uh, I'll just do that a little bit, but I won't go as extensive as I did this morning because we don't have the time this afternoon. Um, a lot of people ask me how you know I got into this work, what we're doing in Chicago, and why uh, uh, why is it necessary that we move to what we call independent black institutions. My background is not unlike most of our people in this country. Um, serious poverty, uh, uh, growing up in a single parent home, uh, born in the South, came up South to Chicago uh, very early, and was in a situation where uh, my mother could not really cope, and by the time she was 24, 25 years old, the only kind of job she could find was basically in bars and taverns. Of course, in that kind of life, you moved to other kind of lives, by the time she was 26, 27 years old, she was just about really deep into drugs and alcohol. Uh, by the time she was 30, she was confirmed at it. Uh, by the time she was 35, she was dead. And so at 16, I was on my own. And I left Chicago, left Detroit and went to Chicago. Took the Greyhound bus, went to Chicago, basically stayed in the YMCA, went to school. But I have a sister also who felt and the brunt of um, you know what happened to us. Uh, at 14, she had her first child. By the time she was 16, she had two. By the time she was 18, she had three. By the time she was 20, she had four. By the time she was 25, she had six children. And uh, only one father of the two of them never been married. So her life was just at that point ruined because she did not have enough education to deal with the children herself. And most certainly, the men that she was dealing with didn't really care about the children. So, at 17, I found myself out of high school, six feet one inch, about 131 pounds, looked like walking death, skin and bones. Couldn't get a job anywhere. Even got turned down by the Air Force. You know, Air Force, our armed forces, we call boy jobs. And got turned down because I had a so-called heart murmur. Joined a magazine selling group. This is 1960 now. Four cars black men and women, traveling through southern Illinois, selling magazines door to door. And we would go to doors, knocking on doors, trying to sell the modern magazines at that time, and lying about we're trying to work our way through college. The interesting thing about this was that this is the first time it ever entered my mind to go to college. I came out of high school that we didn't have any counselors telling us that we need to go and seek higher education at any level. And so, down through southern Illinois, in Galesburg, I was knocked on the door, and this black man answered the door, and I gave him my pitch. And he said, well, it looks like you're kind of hungry. Why don't you come on and get something to eat? <laughs> well, I was hungry, and I did go in to eat. And then he asked me a very important question, and a question I was not able to answer. Well, what college are you going to? Now, see, at that point, we just was generic, okay? But when he began to question me, then, of course, other, other questions came and came, and he began to advise me. A stranger, a black man, and all Illinois. So we left, and his questions kept ringing in my mind about higher education. It ended up in St. Louis, Missouri. I got very ill off the food we were eating from fast food places. The people I was traveling with left me in a $2, $50 a day motel. And at that point, I didn't have any money. So basically what I did was go to the poor man's bank, which was the pawn shop. Pawned everything I had. That time I was trying to play the trumpet, pawned my horn. I had one new suit I had that I used for my mother's funeral. I pawned that. I pawned my overcoat and everything. Sent half to my sister and used the half the money to go back to the Y and continue to look for work in St. Louis. But to make a long story short, I couldn't find any work in St. Louis. And 
I said, well, let me try the military again. Very deep, very and so what happened was I went to the Army this time. So I couldn't get into the Air Force because of a physical condition. I said, I go into the Army. So when I went into the Army to get the physical, there was a big room, number of white physicians. I looked for the youngest white boy there to be examined by. And so when I went to him, he caught the, the misbeating in my heart and asked me was a problem. I said, well, look, this is the first time I've been away from home. I ain't never been around this many white people before in my life. I'm nervous, okay? And so I got into the Army, all right? Now, the Army for me was both a blessing in disguise and, of course, a curse also. One, I put myself in a position where men less intelligent now would give me orders for the next three years. But two, this is the first time that I had three meals a day. It's the first time I had new clothes. It's the first time I had any kind of serious salary. This is the first time that I had a bed of my own, all right? So I'm saying that so the army for me was not difficult at all. <coughs> this is 1960. And, but I was shocked into a new reality. I had basically been induced, introduced to black literature by my mother, who at 13 uh, told me to go to the library to get a book by Richard Wright and Tyler Black Boy. I refused to go because I didn't want to go any place asking for anything black. Okay? But she prevailed and I went. And I was so ashamed of being black. At that time, black was really fighting term. Okay? And so when I went to the library, I didn't even ask the library for the book. I went and found it on the shelf myself. Took it to a corner and began to sit down and read the book. Black Boy changed my life. It was very significant for me to come along at that time because here was a young man, you know, groping for answers. And so what Richard Wright taught me in terms of Black Boy, even though I could not fully understand it at 13, was that there was poverty indeed greater than my own, one. And two, there was a world out there that I had no idea what was happening at all. Just another world. And so from Blackboard, other books began to follow, began to study in terms of other literature. But coming in from St. Louis to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, on the bus to basic training, I was reading Here I Stand by Paul Rose. Okay? When I stepped off the bus, he was a drill sergeant who saw the book, he grabbed the book and said, why, why are you reading this black communist? He said, he's going to mess up your Negro mind. And of course, he pushed me back up against the bus, and my reaction is to, you know, just to react. But of course, all the other men, we just stood up against, against the bus. So what happened? He took the book, held it up over his head, and began to tear the pages out. And as he tore the pages out of the book, he gave it to the recruits, who were mainly white. There's only three blacks there. He gave the pages to the recruits and said, OK, ladies, use this for toilet paper. Boom. What I learned from that lesson was that ideas are important. Ideas are crucial. Ideas run the world. And men and women are afraid of ideas. And what has happened in the black community, for the most part, we are not taught to think critically. We are taught to believe. It's much easier to believe than think. And so I realized that essentially Islam is an idea. Christianity, that's an idea. Politics, that's an idea. Whether you're Democrat or Republican, those are ideas, you see. The point is, who controls the ideas that we essentially, our lives revolve around? Okay, do we control them or somebody else control them? And what I began to see very early is that black people do not control the ideas in our own community. Therefore, we cannot function in our best interest, all right? So that's when study began to move at another level. I learned to read at another level. I began to essentially digest books on a daily basis. In fact, my schedule was a book a day. I began to write about each book I read, a 150, 250 word essay about the book. And I began to go through black literature as if it was life and death. In fact, black literature was just as important to me as lovemaking at that time. I didn't play basketball. And so it was key that I began to essentially try to answer those questions about life. Why am I here? You know, why did we get here? You said that? And that you ask the average black person, well, how did you get here? Well, we didn't walk on water or uh, 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 come first class TWA. That essentially, there was a process, a process of enslavement of our people that for the most part is still not taught in the proper way in our schools at all. So what I decided at 18, 19 years old, Especially after I got through Du Bois, got through uh, 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 Sirik Lincoln, began to read uh, all the, the major writers, Carl McKay, uh, Lason Hughes, going through all the major literature at that time that was available. 
uh, Chester Hines. Chester Hines and, and the work of Chester Hines, which you all may know by the uh, a Grave Digger, Digger, Digger Jones and the, the, the Harlem novels. But Chester Hines was, is a, was a serious novelist. Third generation, if he hauls, let him go. I mean, he's just a couple of the books that he wrote, he wrote other than. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to make is, is that very early, I was beginning to get a political and a literary education from the literature I was reading. And the literature has, always, has, begin, has maintained a, become a very important part of my life. And so what I began to see was that one of the tragedies of black life in America is that too many black people never acquired insight into their own existence. That is, that, that, that they just do not know who they are. And this confusion about identity and source is at the core of our ignorance. You know, the Africans have a saying, quote, if you don't know who you are, any history will do, end quote. Well, welcome to America. This is a land where, 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 where the, the, the Europeans came and committed uh, genocide against the indigenous people of this land, where New York was purchased with beads, where the abnormal defines normality, and where young people live and breathe off the birds of burnt out rock stars with their noses cut off. And so it became key in terms of my own development was that if we are to function in the arena of ideas, is that we gotta go on the offense rather than defense. And so at 19, 18, 19 years old, I stopped apologizing for being black or being African in America. So I came out of service, went right into the civil rights movement, right into the black power movement, and then I'm gonna go into that whole, whole history. But we found the Third World Press in 1967. Prior to that, I published my first book myself, which was Think Black. Pulled the poems together in 1966, took them to a publisher, to a printer, had them printed, stood on corners of Chicago and around the country, sold the book, sold about 600 in a week, scared me to death. Decided to go back and began to continue to publish. In 1967, I started Third World Press, primarily because out in Detroit, Michigan, Dudley Randall started Broadside Press, and he picked up my second book and the first one, began, and we developed a publisher uh, uh, author relationship. But once I earned some, began to earn money as a poet, then I decided to put that money into building independent black institutions. And the first one was Third World Press. Third World Press is 23 years old this year. We published about 130 writers, including uh, writers such as Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, Sonia Sanchez, Mari Evans, uh, Chancellor Williams, uh, Chick Diop. Uh, we got a serious book coming out by uh, Francis Cress Wells in about eight weeks. So I'm saying we got a whole list. Lucini Perkins, who was here at this workshop, and so forth. Um, after we had Third World Press, then we developed the Institute of Positive Education, primarily because I came out of an activist background, that activism was in my blood and a part of my life. And so the Institute of Positive Education exists in Chicago, Illinois. And we have essentially a full-time school for children, which is New Constant Development Center. We have a full service bookstore, which is African American Book Center, and we are now bringing back our magazine, Black Books Bulletin, which will be an annual starting again in December of this year. And so the key thing I see in terms of our continued development as a people is that we have got to understand the importance of independent black institutions. Okay. Now, the education that I received and the education that, 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 that most of our people receive is unlike the type of education that white people receive for the most part in this country. I was raised in white <coughs> studies, okay? White studies. That the only way I got to black studies was on the QT, on the side. Did not learn anything in the formal setting, okay? And this is why it's so important that when we push for black studies and African American studies in the 60s, that, that we recognize that the people have got to be grounded in themselves if they are to develop at any level. Okay, so it was very important to us. And what I recognized very early was that there was two different types of education. I'll never forget, at 10 years old, my mother on my birthday took me to a five and dime store to buy me a present. She bought me a little blue airplane. And this airplane uh, had blue propeller, a blue string on it, and blue wheels. And this was made of plastic. You know, you just roll along the ground. Now this is before the graduate had come out. You know, so plastic, you know, had not really hit it. Uh, at the level that they talked about in the graduate. Am I above your head doing something? No. Okay, all right. And so the, we would roll this plastic airplane on the ground, but my mother did day work out in Dearborn, Michigan. You know, day work at that time was, you know, when black women went to clean up white folks' homes? Okay. And so she would take us out to Dearborn once in a while, 
And what I noticed in Dearborn, Michigan, that there weren't any five and dime stores. There were craft shops. There were hobby shops. And when we went into the homes, we saw that, that essentially in Noah's and next communities, the mothers and fathers took their sons and daughters to these craft shops, bought airplanes in a box with some wood and some direction, and essentially they'll bring those airplanes home, put them on a table, and begin to sit there for days, putting them together, you know, working with them, using the neck up, the brain, this brain computer that Francis Wilson called it, and, as, as, and, and what was happening, that they were learning math, physics, and science, and, 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 and the work ethic, okay? And guess what? As they put the plane together, they would take it outside and it would fly. All right? Well, you got two different types of consciousness developing. My mother brought me an airplane, which is the consumer side of it, okay? Brought the plastic airplane home and hoped it would work, okay? But over here, you invest in it, you bring it home, you build it, and you will guarantee that it will work. And so what was happening in our community, you develop consumers, you develop people that will buy and spend and hope it work. But over here, you're developing people that will make an investment, but more importantly, you're developing people that essentially who are about learning how to run the world. Not run after, run the world. And so you have less than 9% of the world's population running in the world. And it's not an accident. And I'm saying that these people are on a course. So I'm giving you the story to, record, to begin to put into to, 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 to a context that essentially the condition which we live in is not an accident. It is not an accident. But what happens all too often is that our people do not have the time to study, do not have time to go into the literature, do not have time to consult with people who've had time to go into the literature, and we often have in our community what we call a victim's analysis. And so we end up blaming each other time and time again for every problem that exists in the black community, and therefore very seldom get anything done. So it was clear to me that what was happening is that in many cases, we were evolved around what I call a negative information bank. A negative information bank, for the most part, is mass media, television, radio, newspapers, okay? And television mainly. Anytime somebody sit up and look at television six or seven hours a day, there's very little they can give back to the world of beauty, of substance, unless you're talking about, how, how, about as the world turns backwards or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that you can talk about, okay? And so with this negative information bank, it does not allow us to essentially develop and have discourse in the arena of ideas, okay? Unless it's ideas that we're not dealing with the running of the world, or by extension, our own communities, okay? So, it was clear to me that if we were to function at any serious level, that we have to understand that racism is not only alive and well in America, it's a growth industry. And we understand that white supremacy is a given fact of life in this world and is not vanishing. Therefore, we cannot, if we are intelligent, men and women, continue to use racism as an excuse to not execute our worldview. Do I need to repeat that? Yes. I'm saying essentially that if we understand that white supremacy exists, and it's not going any place, not now, all right, and as we fight to destroy it, that we cannot allow white supremacy or racism to stop us from bringing forth our worldview, you see, for what exists. So I'm saying we can stand all day and say, well, I can't do nothing because of racism. Boom. I can't do nothing because of white supremacy. Boom. Then you're not going to get anything done. All right? So I'm saying that, that, that we need to essentially understand that if this is clear, we will save a lot of hearts and minds that think we can change white people with conversation, spiritual sharing, money, or astronomy. It's not going to happen. Okay? <laughs> it's not going to happen. And so white men and their women kick ass and dig graves all over the world. All right. Therefore, in this country, black men are still involved in the establishment of a significant first, such as first jail, first killed in the streets, first underemployed, first fired, first confined to mental institutions, first in prison, first lynched, first involved with drugs and alcohol, first miseducated, first denied medical treatment, first in suicide, first to be blamed for black problems. Indeed, black men are the first victims. But the concept of black men being the first victims is not to set in motion the argument of who's oppressed the greatest, black men or black women. Oppression is oppression. And to quibble over degrees of oppression more often than not is an accurate measurement of the effectiveness of white oppression. 
However, there are some basic male dynamics that need to be understood. And I want to be very clear about this. Men run the world. This is not a sexist statement, but one of fact. It indeed is a sexist reality. Okay? And there's a difference. And I think it's very important that we understand this. There may be women in leadership positions elected and appointed, but they're there because men see such concessions as politically wise and in their best interest. White men control most of the world, politically, economically, and most certainly militarily, and undoubtedly control much of the Western, if not all the Western, Northern world, the part of the world in which we reside in. Other facts are, white men do not fear white women. They're concerned, yes, but fearful, no. White men and white women are partners, be a senior and junior partner. That this whole feminist movement is a family battle. White women, dissatisfied with white men, go out and start their own movement, bring everybody else in to fight their men, then they go home and mate, and the white race continue on. Okay? So I'm saying anytime white women go outside of their race to mate, or white men, you don't get white. All right? So it's very clear that there's less than 9% of the world's population, if they have to maintain even that 9%, they got to mate with each other. Okay? Two, white men do not fear black women. The white man's relation to black women traditionally has been one of use sexually and otherwise. The widespread of color that exists among black people proves this point. It was white men raping black women that produced mixed race black person worldwide. In fact, in South Africa, the colored race didn't even exist until about nine months after the white boy got there. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm saying that white men see black women as sexual surrogates and potential allies even though black women do not, in terms of their consciousness, play into that. Okay? I'm saying it's a forced move on black women. Okay? But white men have forced themselves on women <coughs> of other cultures all around the world. Mm -hmm. Alright? Now, white men do fear black men. And this fear may not be spoken and obvious to many black people, but as one that understands the history of white, black, male, black relationships, it's quite evident that there's a history of war with the horde of severe physical and psychological enslavement and elimination of black men by white men. In fact, Sterling Brown's words are instructive here when he says a black, white men venture to the black community, they don't come by ones, they don't come by twos, they come by tens. So the black male, white male confrontation, not only racial and cultural, it is a serious question of what group of men is going to run I rule the world. But the concept of shared power has always been a major question within the white male ethos, especially involved the inclusion of men outside their racial or cultural grouping. It must be understood that white men actually don't like or trust each other. Their cultural, religious, and nationalist wars are legendary. Any serious set of European wars will validate this point. When one analyzes the warlike nature white men exhibit among each other, only the naive and severely mentally handicapped would expect white male attitudes toward black males to be any different than they are. These attitudes are historical and cultural and therefore psychological and intimate. To change such negative and so-called natural attitudes require a revolution of the most profound kind, which I'm not about to get myself involved in. The black male, white male dynamic can be best described as one of continued, unrelenting war, with black males being constantly on the losing end of most battles. When you say war, well, what do you mean by war? I served on a National Commission on Crime and Justice. I just left Philadelphia Friday and Saturday. We had national hearings. Uh, this, co this commission is set up by the American Friends Service Committee, which are basically the Quakers who started the whole prison system in this country 200 years ago. So they called this commission together to see why the prison's not working. All right? And so we, for the last two days, been listening to testimony by mothers, by sisters, by inmates, by brothers, by people working in the correction field. And as you know, two months ago, the sentencing project up in D.C. issued this report that one in four black men are involved in the criminal justice system at some level, parole, incarceration, uh, 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 in, in, in the courts and so forth. One in four, one in ten uh, Latino, Hispanic, and one in 16 white. That hit our community like a loud thump. One in four between the ages of 19 and 29. But you know what? It's worse than that. Because that report was taken over a very short period in July. It's worse than that. And so I'm saying to you at one level, 
that this war we're in is a war that we are not fighting. You see what I'm saying? When, when, when you know, nations go to war, nations prepare, they arm themselves, they, 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 they train, and then they go to war. All right? Uh, two fighters may go to war. They train for six weeks. I mean, with the possible exception of Tyson. I'm saying they train to get ready for But what has happened to us, we are not a homogeneous group of black people going anywhere. All right? Why? Any Sunday morning, we following thousands and thousands of leaders. Okay? That all got the answer to our problem. Number one. Number two, when we begin to realize it, that, that, that essentially the major economic institutions in the black community <coughs> that we control are not businesses, you see, that service our community and provides goods and services. The major business institution in the black community is the church. It's a billion dollar business. Other than drugs, it's the major business. The, but the other legitimate business that makes also billions of dollars a year is one that very few of us ever think of. You know what it is? Funeral homes. Mm, yeah. Okay? So I'm saying you got the church saving you, you got the funeral homes bearing you. Okay? And I'm saying the church at some point give back, but the funeral homes very seldom give back anything. They get off scot free. Okay? And so it becomes very clear to me that if we are to really do battle, and that's what we have to do is do battle, is that we have to recognize that what's happening in the black community because we are scattered. Okay, in terms of ideas, in terms of, 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 of communities, in terms of, of, of functioning, our families. And so what happened to us vis-a-vis -vis white men, white people, is terrorism. Our young men are being picked off. It is an act of terrorism. It's not war because we're not combating it. You see what I'm saying? We're not coming back with a force as great as it, theirs to stop it. You see? So it's not war. All right? Okay. And so... The internal direction of black people to a large degree is destructively influenced by the ongoing black male, white male conflict. White men in the United States control everything of material value. And this is true in all the life-giving areas such as economics, entertainment, politics, science, sports, education, law, communication, real estate, and the military. Okay? And if black men want to be a part of the Euro-American structure in an intimate and non-superficial way, they will have to give us the most important aspect of their being, their blackness. And in thought and action, they will have to become white. A transformation that is ultimately impossible, but tempting enough to the unconscious black man that means in this country on a daily basis unknowingly betray their people, themselves, and the future of their children. All right. Okay. When any people, especially if it is landless and defenseless, loses as men in a world ruled by men, that people ceases to be a threat to anybody. Okay? So therefore, the major systems and subsystems in this country are geared toward the systematic destruction of the men. And you get them during the warrior age, 1929. Okay? All right. Now, how do you neutralize the brothers? How do you neutralize them? with about eight ways that we are neutralized on a daily basis. One, you create black men who will be and act white in thought, actions, and images. In effect, acculturation or seasoning. This produces black men who consciously work in the best interest of their teachers. Okay? I said I was raised in white city, so therefore, the Irish, Polish, Jews, Italians were my teachers. And so when I came out of school, I was thinking about, you know, the Irish Negro, Polish Negro, Italian Negro, and Jewish Negro. That's what I thought. <laughs> So I'm saying white studies, right? Now, so when we began to move toward black studies, all of a sudden we're talking about racism in reverse. Somehow we cannot be talking about being wise, okay? We can't talk about being like them, wanting to learn their own culture, okay? And so the seasoning process is what has brought us to this point. What I mean by seasoning? Some people call it acculturation, but it's much deeper than acculturation. When I say seasoning, it's like taking an elephant out of Africa bringing an elephant to America and making an elephant jump through hoops. <laughs> Elephants don't jump through hoops <laughs> in Africa. Okay, so the seasoning is a denurturing, okay, of a people. And where we got Negroes jumping through hoops, okay, at another level. So what happens is, let's say this is Africa right here. And say, does this river represent the Nile Valley? So you take this picture 
And you fill it up with Nile Valley water and foliage, which represents our people. Okay? You come across the Great Ocean, and each mile of travel, you drop water into the Great Ocean. And when you get to this side of the, of the world, to America, whatever water is left, you pour it out into the ocean, take the picture, fill it up with Mississippi mud, and you got the Negro. Okay? What I mean essentially is we are the people. I'm talking about our Holocaust now, where our best historians talk to, tell us that we lost approximately 69 million plus. Where essentially we were forced into a situation in this country where we could not practice our bonding traditions, where we could not speak our languages, where essentially we could not maintain our families. And so I'm saying that we have been scattered around the world. In fact, when you came to America's, you got now, today, in 1990, over 69 million people of African descent in Brazil speaking Portuguese. You got over 35 million people of African descent right here in America speak, attempting to speak English. Okay? <laughs> and so we don't even communicate with each other. And so it became very clear to me that the seasoning process was very effective because therefore no serious definition of black manhood is ever contemplated. It never comes in our minds to define what black manhood is. And when we define it because of the seasoning, we define it as the opposite of white manhood, or we define it as the same thing as white manhood and just color it black. All right. So the call from white people is always to rise above one's culture, tradition, and history if you are African American, while everybody else practices theirs. Okay? Let me just tell you, give you one other example of what I mean. I live in Chicago. In Chicago, you got Polish town, you got Irish town, you got Italian town, you got Jewish town, right? You go over to any of these, these areas in Chicago, these strong ethnic areas in Chicago, you don't see no black businesses. You see, that? You see Polish, Irish, Italian, Jewish businesses, okay? Other thing is, I don't care whatever's happening in Poland, you're going to hear about it in Chicago, Polish town. The same thing in Ireland, same thing in Israel, and the same thing you know, for, for, for in Italy, okay? Now, so I'm saying that, that, that another example was last year in Tenement Square when the Chinese students began to try to move towards some type of a, a democratization is that they began to call over here and telephone calls went back. They began to fax material. You sent to aunts and uncles and great grandparents trying to get information back and forth. And the same thing happened in Poland in terms of the Polish Revolution and so forth. But how many of you in here today can call a grandmother in Tanzania? our grandfather in Nigeria, our uncle in Uganda, you see, our cousin in Kenya, our, our relative in Senegal. You know what I'm saying? That's the crime. The crime is a disconnecting. That's the Holocaust. You see what I'm saying? And therefore, our whole uh, 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 existence is built upon a slave history which is not inspirational and which is not developmental and it can lead us nowhere into except being greater slaves. That's all. Okay. Two, how do you neutralize the men? You drive black men out of the economic sector, thereby making it impossible for them to take care of themselves and their families in the American way. If fruitful work is not available, most men will seek other avenues of employment. A life of crime, quote unquote, or the underground economy is the next step for many of them. All right, look. Every ethnic group after the white Anglo Saxon Protestants got here had to at some point be involved in an underground economy. The difference between their underground economy and our underground economy is that our underground economy is based upon drugs. The dissemination, the use, the trafficking of drugs. Number one. Number two, we don't even control the drugs coming to the country. But I'm saying essentially it's based upon that of one level. All right. Take it another one. We were pushed out of this economy at a real serious level in the 60s. White women came back in. The whole move toward integration, the whole dissolution across the country of independent black institutions, cultural institutions, because of what? Integration. Everybody want to be in America. All right? We could not come in at any force. The whole national welfare system, aid to families, dependent children, began to essentially legislate that in order for the families to receive the money, the brothers couldn't be there. We'll start again. All right? I can't really get too deep in this. I don't have the time. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that black men and some women begin to go into the underground economy and begin to swallow us up at another level. All right, now, let's just take a little bit further. I'm saying to you 
that the chief criminals in America are not black men pushing drugs. That essentially the major drug users in America are white men. 70% of drug users are used by white men. All right? They bring it in, they disseminate it to our community, then the young black boys and men push it into the black community. They're on the bottom end. It's like the butt end of the whole drug thing. Is it disastrous? Is it killing our community? Absolutely yes. All right, no doubt about it at all. All right. But the chief criminals in this country are white men. When you're talking about serious crime, let's talk about the savings and loan industry. You're talking about a, a minimum of $400 billion crime. At minimum, okay? You're talking about junk bombs. You're talking about essentially, we haven't even got to the bank yet. Just get ready for the banks to go next. Right. Okay? The point I'm trying to make is, is that a, at a Milcom, a Bosky, Bosky, or, or all these white boys, they get a big fine. They get a milk of what, $600 million fine? That's one year's salary. Okay? That's chump change. All right? And so essentially what happens is we begin to understand that I tell young brothers, if you want to be serious about crime, don't be snatching no purses. Be selling these drugs. You go get you an MBA or law degree. You'll be a serious criminal. Okay? But what happens is we commit the crime. And therefore, use prison system as a breeding ground for hard, non-political black men who, for the most part, will return and prey on their own communities. There are, of course, exceptions. Now, I'm saying, if I cannot feed my family, if I can't take care of myself, I'm going to take it from somebody, too. The problem between me and the average brother is that I'm conscious. So therefore, I'm going to take it from those who took it from us, the white boy. All right? Four. Supply black men with unlimited negative options and incorrectly defined as freedom, such as drugs, nightlife, alcohol, unrestricted sex, the use of drugs, and other stimulus, has seriously affected the black community in a destructive manner. The constant search for fun, pleasure, or the next high is a basic example of immature, enslaved mind. What I mean by that is simply this. We confuse liberation with mobility. I left Chicago Friday, went to Philadelphia, stayed there for two days, and then came up here this morning. That's mobility, OK? I'm not liberated. When you talk about liberation, any people who are liberated, what? They can feed themselves, they can clothe themselves, they can house themselves, they educate themselves, they can define themselves, and most certainly they can defend themselves. Mm -hmm. That's liberation. But you can't answer yes to those that you're not liberated. All right? We move from chattel slavery to scientific slavery. From open and raw racism to neo-racism. Okay? Now, the other part of that is, is that we look at these options as freedoms. Drug, night, life. Okay. Who in the hell said that we got a party every weekend? <laughs> what? Okay. Now that we have to party every weekend, we spend two or three days a week in the part of the week looking for what we're going to party in. <laughs> That's why we allowed that. Nobody takes us seriously. Okay? Let's take it to another level. Everybody in this room, on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis, use something from Japan. Tell me if I'm lying. How many of you on a daily, weekly, monthly basis use anything made in African America or Africa other than a hair oil? I mean, as many toothpicks as these brothers suck on, we don't even have a toothpick factory. Okay? And so I'm saying that we have to understand is that we do not control the economics even of our own communities. All right? And what happens is that when the people are oppressed, is that what ha we end up fighting each other and arguing over nonsense. <laughs> You see, while other cultures come in and make a comfortable living off of us. In Chicago, you got the Arabs, and you got the Koreans, you got the Asians, okay? Now, other key. When the Japanese were whooped by this country and its allies in Europeans' war on the world number two, okay, they recognized that they had to move another way in order to continue to do better because the Japanese recognized that they are an imperial people, that they are strong people, they lost this war, but they're not going to lose the next one. Okay? Now, the difference between them and us, other than the cultural racial difference, is that when they lost the war, this country did not split them up, you know, send their families around the world. They were able to stay in Japan on that island, and the family stayed intact. And essentially, what they did, they sent their best and brightest children to the best schools in the world, and they came back. Mm -hmm. What do we send our best and brightest? Well, we send them to the best schools too, but they don't come back. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying to you, it is not a challenge to get out there and join a Fortune 500, a thousand company, and make money for the white boy. That ain't no challenge. 
Okay? The challenge is, at some point, you begin to come back to this community. Okay, this box represents the white community. The circle represents the black community. And I'm saying we move from the different levels of slavery. And so, what do we produce in the black community as life giving and life saving other than ourselves? Okay? What do we produce other than ourselves, self, biologically, and what? Our art forms. Okay? The music, you see what I'm saying? The, the visual art, the literature, and so forth. Everything else of value that's life giving and life saving comes in the black community from the white community. Where do we get our water from? Where do we get our food from? Where do we get our communication from? Where do we get our used homes from? <laughs> Where do we get our, mis our, 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 our education from? Where do we get our used values from? Where do we get our employment from? Okay? Our leadership talk about we have a $250 billion economy. They don't tell you that that economy is based upon black people working for white people. So what? If black people do not work for white people, no economy. No economy. Okay? And so at one point we have to realize that since we have moved to another level of slavery. Now, well, you say, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, again, ideas. You ask the average blood, especially in academia, and say, what's the problem? Well, the problem is welfare. Got too many people on welfare. They don't want to work. Please. What's the problem? Well, the problem is capitalism, man. You know, you don't understand capitalism. Well, what the problem? Well, the problem is communism. That's the problem. The communists are trying to take over the world. Well, what's the problem? We don't get enough food stamps. That's the problem. Well, no, that's not the problem. The problem is politics, huh? That's the problem. Well, you can't be right. The problem must be what? Spacemen or something. Okay? I'm saying when we buy into the systems, we buy into their definitions, whatever they may be. But the person that gives us all these definitions are white people. White world supremacy. That's the problem. You see, we buy into their paradigm. Okay? Whatever they tell us, we buy into it. Okay. Now, so I'm saying at one point, we have begun to begin to move toward what we call independent black institutions. Okay, I'm going to come back. I'm just going to run through this. I'm going to you'll get to the answers. The driving black men out of the economic sector, thereby making it impossible for them to take care of their families. Moving us into the prisons, Come out of the prisons, move to what we call the negative options. Number five, drive black men crazy. You drive us crazy, therefore we turn against ourselves and the black community. Then the only recourse left will be A, mental hospitals, B, homelessness, C, suicide, or D, black on black destruction. We see it every day. Brothers walking up the street talking to themselves, mm -hmm. singing to themselves. You know, I'm just saying that, that crazy. Why? Bobby Wright called it mental side. Six, Make them the so-called women, quote unquote, in which case homosexuality and bisexual activity become the norm rather than the exception. Men of other cultures do not fear the so-called, quote unquote, women like men of any race. That's so important. Is that what I'm saying essentially is that I don't want you to think that I'm homophobic, but it's clear that whatever you do in the privacy of your room, that's your business. I don't even want to know about it. The only problem I have is when you make it into a political movement and therefore say, this is normal. I cannot in good conscience ever tell my children that that's normal, okay? Because I don't believe it, all right? I don't believe it. Because if it was normal, then number one, there would be more other in all races, and number two, then the race would not duplicate itself. Okay, it's just not normal. But, at my, but, but the point I'm trying to make is, we have to at the same time be sensitive to those persons who are homosexuals and recognize that they have to deal with it Okay? And we have to understand them the best we can because we have a lot of black people who are indeed homosexual. So I'm saying we have to expand our minds a little bit more to try to understand what they may be going to because I have met very few who are happy. Okay? Mm. Seven, teach black men to believe in a force greater than their own lives, their own, their own people, their own culture, their own destiny. So African American men's internal monitors, gut feelings and gut reactions, their spiritual connection to reality and their sense of self have been destroyed spiritually and culturally. Their moves towards self-determination and self-reliance are always questioned and put down as unimportant or meaningless. So that means that any time a black man tries to stand up to do something, somebody putting them down. He can't make it. You see what I'm saying? Get a little mom pop though. Well, what are all these Korean stands out here? That's mom and pop. Okay? And I'm saying the way they finance their stuff is, is, is a wonder to behold. 
You know, I don't have time to get into all that. But the point is, number eight, you don't neutralize a brother all his way, what do you do? You kill him. Mentally and physically. When you kill a brother, you kill him in a way that strikes fear into the hearts of all other brothers. The way they killed Malcolm X, King, Mark Essex, Fred Hampton, and so forth. All right. So I'm saying that we are neutralized in this way. We say, well, what about the leadership, Haki? Well, the leadership has been neutralized too. Anytime you got somebody walking around in two thousand dollar suits and ten cents mind, you know they're neutralized. <laughs> <laughs> And so what I'm saying that essentially is that this neutralization continues on at the leadership. We are the only people that got a professional leadership. <laughs> Tell me if I'm wrong, okay? I'm not naming no names, but you know who I'm talking about. That essentially all these people do is lead. And guess what? They got serious money. These people are rich. Okay? They're rich. Alright? And I'm saying, uh, you know, that, that, that we have to begin to really bring these people to task. Look, when you look at white Western world leadership and black Western world leadership, you see two different entities. One, when you talk about white Western world leadership, you see mainly first businessmen. Two, politicians. Three, the military. Four, academic. And five, support would be one, religious. Education, you know, sports, entertainment, you can go on and on. When you look at black Western world leadership, you see mainly black male ministers. All right, then the support group follows. Now, I'm saying that this leadership cannot possibly deal with this leadership. Why? Because they've been trained either directly or indirectly by white male ministers, using their books and everything else. And so I'm saying they may indeed be spiritual and moral men, and we do need these type of men and women, okay? But the point is, they can't deal with businessmen who are about one world economy. What do you think Eastern Europe is about? One world economy, okay? Now I'm saying that, yeah, you can have community control. You can be the biggest church as you want to be, okay? When you start talking about challenging this, you're ready to go to war. That's serious war here. Our leadership cannot deal with politicians who are politicians 24 hours a day who kiss your baby in the morning and sign a contract on your life at night. This is the most corrupt area of the world. Why? Anytime somebody spends 27 million dollars for a sentence like Jesse Helms did last time, what's that about? Especially when you make less than $200,000 a year, including perks. So I'm going to spend 27 million dollars for a seat. That means you won't get eight, nine times that from somewhere. Okay? So I need to begin to understand, brothers and sisters, that politics is corrupt to the bone, all right? Third number, the military. The military in this country don't pray, they don't negotiate, they'll just take you off the earth and leave you where you want to go, quietly or loudly. These people do not pray. That's what Grenada was about, that's what Panama was about, and Bush, who is not as stupid as Reagan, essentially had a coup when he put Colin Powell as head of Joint Chiefs. So here you got a Negro standing up explaining why you go into a black country panel. <laughs> Check that out. You <laughs> can't deal with the third, fourth level, which is academia, because in academia, you said you have your research and your develop. You have technology also. You see what I'm saying? That what happens is, is that there's an incestuous relationship. They go in and out of politics. I mean, you go to Harvard, you got one crew in the White House, and they bring them from Harvard. You got another crew in the White House, they bring them from Stanford. Go in and out. Okay, so I'm saying our leadership, for the most part, do not respect our best and our brightest, and therefore, they do not get the best advice all the time. You don't have the kind of think tanks that these people have. They're essentially feeding information on a daily, daily basis. All right, let me kind of come on down and talk about some, some, uh, uh, some, some answers. I'm sorry I have to go so quickly, but I believe there are answers. I believe we can win this one. In fact, I have very few doubts that we cannot win. I want you to call a realistic optimist. And the reason I am a realistic optimist is because I have children. I love my children. We went to school in Chicago, school for children. We, we served children between the two and a half to eight years old. We, Run the school, New Concert Development Center, for almost 20 years. One of the few African American uh, uh, schools, independent black schools in the country that's not funded by anybody. 
You cannot find anybody in this country that said that the Institute of Positive Education, New Content Development Center, African American Book Center, Third World Press was funded by white people. That's a lie. It never has happened and never will happen. Why? Because essentially we recognized, come out of the struggle of the 60s, that what we needed was independent black institutions working at every level, but primarily at the levels of communication and education. The greatest period of learning for a child between the ages of, what, birth to six years old. Okay? We got to control it. And the only way to begin to control is have our own institutions to do that. All other people do. Why do you think the Catholics started their school system? Why do you think the Jews started their school system? Luther started their school system. Why? Because they recognized the value of education. So it was key to us that we began to move in that direction. But the other thing, too, was that we began to look and see why that all of our businesses that, in many cases, who were not destroyed by the whole move toward in, uh, integration, were destroyed. Well, one reason was that we had to move into the marketplace and begin to offer our people a level of quality that they had not been getting. Quality. And so quality became and is our watchword. When we say quality, not only in terms of quality in the service, but we begin to move quality to our lives, quality in the interaction, quality in the discussion. Quality in the choosing of a mate. Quality in rearing one's children. Quality in dealing with everybody. Quality in the way one carries oneself. You see what I'm saying? So if I'm carrying myself in a way that's quality, then that means that I'm not going to accept anything from you except what? Quality. You see? Quality is key. And so therefore, that became the key word. All right. Now, do we understand that there are people in this world that go through, throughout their entire lives knowing, not knowing anything about themselves culturally or biologically. And so it was key to understand that learning to take hold of one's life is very difficult in a culture that values property over life. Beware of people trying to make their history, their culture, and their traditions yours. Beware of people trying to put their troubles and fears onto you. The road to life full of stress surely is paid with one's inability to say no to destructive behavior or activity in one's home, job, or in the streets, or in bars at single bar happy hour time. We are prisoners of bad habits. People in the West generally do not die natural deaths. We kill ourselves in any number of ways. Bad nutrition, poor exercise program, unchecked stress, obesity, and we're going on. But this brings me to the bone of change. The bone of change. The ability to look at oneself honestly and design a personalized program for change. And this program must include inner exploration, inner investigation, contemplative solitude, professional consultation, and inner transformation. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, most people receive, have experienced rejection. We have not only experienced rejection, we formulate our lives around being eject, rejected, not being accepted. And this is a terrible burden, especially when one is being eject, rejected when we don't even see the rejected. You black, well, you reject. Okay. And what has happened, we have, you know, learning what not to do can lead one to what to do. However, that's like going through the back door to open the front door. So we say the inner determines the outer. And so how do we begin to change? One, self-knowledge. The Ethiopians have a saying. A cat may go to a monastery, but she still remains a cat. Africans brought to America are still Africans. Yes, we have been changed, but knowing oneself is key to knowing and understanding others. If a person hides from self-understanding or self-knowledge, his or her life will be built upon a bed of quicksand that promises slow but certain death. All people, if they are to develop, must ask a simple and correct question to define life. Why are we here? Where do we come from? What is our purpose in life? Are we here to serve others or ourselves? Self-knowledge leads to self-understanding, which is the path to becoming a whole person. Remember the African proverb that says, quote, wood may remain 10 years in the water, but it will never become a crocodile. <laughs> Two, family. Family is key. People are shaped by other people and culture. All people have mothers and fathers. However, not all mothers and fathers are responsible. Therefore, black families are undergoing a transition. Now, this becomes very important. One is a question of mate, 
It's a question of how do you form and maintain a family, especially in these very stressful times. It's a question of children. And I try to answer all that in the book, but let me just be very succinct. One, if you're using quality as your guide among all the other cultural definitions, it's very clear that you will go after a mate that has something to offer. I mean, you don't want a balloon here, right? Whether he's male or female. It's, you want somebody who essentially is thinking. I met my wife at a community service organization. She was teaching young children how to read and write during the summer. Now, obviously, I didn't know anything about her when I met her, but you know, she looked good. You know, the brothers gravitate toward good looking women. All right? And so I went up and started talking to her and got a name and address and said, you know, look, I'm going to call you. And she always reminded me that I don't I only only got her name and address, I got everybody else's name and address too. <laughs> <laughs> but began to interact with my wife, her name is Sophia. I began to court Sophia. Now it's interesting that here she was a 21 year old woman, and I was rather young at that time myself, who had finished undergraduate school at the University of Illinois, had a master's degree from uh, University of Chicago and was teaching at one of the local universities in Chicago and really on a high track but decided that by the time she got the students it was almost too late. So we began to function together and we built with other brothers and sisters the Institute of Positive Education and her goal was to build an independent school. You see, So we began to work with other brothers and sisters to build this school. So she left her job to come work full time to build the school. Her mother wanted to have her committed. <laughs> Why? Because she had got one of the best educations in the world. Her mother thought she had lost her mind and thought that this man had cast a spell over her. Okay? And so the interesting thing about that was that we continued to work together and we built and we built and we worked and worked in all kinds of national and international organizations to get this done and to do some other things. Now, I mentioned I was in the service. When I was in the Army, I used to, you know, I had to mop floors and sew my own stripes on my uniform and, and do KP duty, uh, take out the garbage, make my bed. All that was no problem. But somehow when we got out of the service, that became women's work. Okay? Now this is very important because what my wife and I began to talk about was that why is it why you're in the service, you're able to do it, and that's not one mumbling word. But when you get out, it's all of a sudden, it's my work. Okay? Now, that's not even logical. It's not logical because here's a woman that had a better education than I had. In fact, she's brilliant. I think that's why she married me. <laughs> the point is, is that in this brilliancy, that I had to begin to sit down and listen to her explain what she felt was fair. And being halfway intelligent myself, it seemed to me that it was fair. So you begin to what? Break up the work. She's working eight, nine, ten hours a day. I'm working eight, nine, ten hours a day. We're trying to build something together. So therefore, you split the house up together. All right? You may cook, I wash the dishes. You say, or vice versa, whatever the case it is. I'm saying that you become equitable in cleaning the house. Now, this is very important for a number of reasons. One, our children grow up seeing this happen. So therefore, the boys quite naturally do it themselves as well as the girls too. All right? Now, so quality became very important, but also the equitable distribution of the work within the house and also outside of the house. So it's very important, and I talk about this in, in, in black men. The next level, uh, which is key, was that recently our mother-in-law, her mother, my mother-in-law, her mother, moved in with us into our house. And so that means that we got three generations. And the reason that we moved her in was not because she's ill, not because she really goes to a nursing home like that, because she travels all around the world. The reason we moved her in is to prepare for tomorrow. One reason. The second reason is that essentially is to give our children the advantage of being in a three-generational household. And also to give them a lesson that essentially they see me and their mother reacting to their grandmother in a way that's very positive. So that means essentially we're going to take care of her if anything ever happens to her which means, by extension, that you take care of your parents. That's right. Okay? So I'm saying that, 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 that all this begins to come together. So within the context of the Institute of Higher Education, we have an extended social family 
within the context of our own family is an extended biological family. And so it all works together. Okay, now, the family is key. And so when you move from the family, you go to the community. Because working families, essentially, the Ethiopians have a proverb that states that the one, to one who does not know a small garden is a forest. That's what a family is in relationship to a community. A working community is a consistent ecosystem that feeds, stimulates, supports, and nurtures families. Communities are impossible without families, and families are strengthened and directly influenced by community-based institutions like houses of worship, schools, universities, businesses, cultural centers, and of course, anything that allows us to not only just survive, but develop community. Four, I'm talking about answers, avoiding stress. Okay, so many of our people are killed on a daily basis because of stress. What we don't understand is that most people worry too much about things they can't change or control anyway. But in the book, I have about 23 ways to deal with stress. But one of the major ways to deal with stress is to have strong families and strong communities that are essentially insulating one against the very cold outside. Why? At the end of the day, I'll go home, my wife will go home, and what we have here is a cultural home. That means when I go home, what's in my house reflects me, reflects my family. What's on the walls, what type of music we want to listen to, the type of books on our bookshelves. See, so you know it's a cultural home, so I, therefore I'm regenerated, okay? Therefore I'm ready to come out the next day and do battle. So that's the same with the family, all right? So it's crucial that one's home reflects that. Five. And it helps to deal with the whole stress thing. I can't go through the whole 23 things around stress, but let me go to number five, critical thinking. I said earlier it's much easier to believe than think, that we have to be taught to think, that critical thinking, thinking for oneself is not easy, especially if it's been done by somebody else all of one's life. The mind is often captured by the insignificant. What do I mean the insignificant? Well, worry about my chip nail, <laughs> okay? Worry about whose name you get on your butt. <laughs> That's insignificant. Do you realize that there are literally millions of children that go to bed every day without food, that are hungry, that are starving? Don't tell me about some fingernails. That's insignificant. Okay? I'm saying essentially critical thinking moves us beyond our small world and begins to expand us. That's the only way you can deal in the world. All right? That expanding, going beyond just our community. Okay? And so I'm saying essentially one can see the Japanese doing it. One can see all the Europeans doing it, but why don't we do it, you see? Then when we look at Africa today, we see war. We see 10 active wars going on now today in Africa. Why? Because one group, one tribe, fight another tribe for power. What's happening in Liberia? What's happening in Ethiopia? What's happening in Chad? What's happening in Angola? You want me to go on? What's happening in Tanzania? What's happening in Nigeria? All right? So I'm saying at one point, Critical thinking comes back to us because if you're not getting three meals a day, if you're not sleeping at least six and seven hours a day, if you're not drinking clean water every day, if you're not getting the proper type of nurturing, you can't think critically. In fact, what's going to happen in Ethiopia and in, 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 in Eritrea, that whole basin where people are just starving to death, you can have a whole generation who can't think because they're mentally impaired. All right? And so I'm saying at one point the critical thinking comes back to us because we, become, we can become the light of the black world, the African world. But we have got to take ourselves on another serious level. If we are the, indeed the best and the brightest, at my age, my children should be able to come to me and say, well look, can I get a job? That means if I cannot supply my child with a job, that means I know other men that can in our community at some point. You know what I'm saying? If we are functioning at the level that we should function. You see what I'm saying? Because all other serious men do that and women do that. They create the institutions in their community to take care of their own people. And by extension, moving out of the community. All right? I'm saying third world press, all right, is not just a Chicago-based publishing company anymore. It is a world-based publishing company. We publish African writers all around the world. We sell books all around the world in the English-speaking world, all right? And so I'm saying at some point, then, if our work meant anything, this is why I'm saying in all of my books, I talk about what can be done rather than talk about what cannot be done. That's important that we develop the institutions that essentially accent what one's feel because it's easy to talk about what needs to be done. 
I used to do it too. I'm saying, look, as a poet, you know, a poet is a dreamer. <laughs> okay? And I'm saying, how do you move from dreaming to begin to move to actualize these ideas? Well, what wake me up is I woke up one day and saw we about forty, fifty thousand dollars in debt. Why? Because I'm not a businessman. Well, I am now, but I wasn't then. You come up and ask for a book, I'll give you a book. Then care anything about it. You see what I'm saying? A lot of people to come in and work at some point and steal you, steal, steal everything from you. Okay? You know but the point I'm trying to make is that you got to move from another level to another. Level. Okay, six discipline and motivation. That you cannot accomplish anything without discipline. I don't really need to go into that, but you understand what I'm talking about. Seven, personal health, eating correctly, and exercising. I've been a vegetarian for over 20 years. I've been in this movement for over 25, almost 30 years. I'm saying even in this movement, people think my diet is weird. I've been calling man to eat weeds and all that stuff. Look, I don't get no headaches. I don't get no stomach aches. I am in good shape, all right? I am not burned out. I love life, okay? I see a whole lot to live for, all right? And I'm saying partially because the diet at one level, it's kept me healthy. I don't suck on nobody's bones, all right? I haven't had no meat in over 20 years, all right? And I'm saying that essentially you gotta watch everything that you take in your body from the water to the food, okay? So I'm saying that ideas at one level, but at the same time you gotta deal with the whole physical side too. Other side is exercise. Is that one has got to be active if the body's gonna be healthy. How do you reverse or slow down the aging process, all right? For me, I do a whole lot of stuff, but at least for five days, I'm either running five miles a day or cycling 20 miles a day. Okay? And then essentially, that's how you at some point stay ready for battle. And it's key that in order to deal with stress, to have an active exercise program is one of the best ways, you see, in terms of dealing with stress. Because we see now brothers that come out of our movement of the 60s that's totally wasted. All right? You see them walk around always negative. Can't say good about nothing. Look like they're dying. Mm -hmm. All right? Because what? They lost the weight. They lost the weight. They lost the weight. They lost the weight. Okay? And I'm saying part of the way is that we have to be very concerned about our health. And do not put our hands into these jive doctors because half of them don't even know what they're talking about. <laughs> A, spiritual search and reciprocity. Always seek answers to the reason for life. The religion one practices is not as important as the practice itself. Most world religions are based upon doing good in the world. When I began to question religion in a serious level is when I began to travel. I would travel among the Igbo, they got an answer for life. I would travel among the Yoruba, they got an answer for life. I would travel among the Zulu, they got an answer for life. I would travel among the Maasai, they got an answer for life. I would go over to India, travel among the Hindus, they got an answer for life. Travel among the Sikhs, they got an answer for life. Travel among the, 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 the Muslims, they got an answer for life. Travel among the Christians, they got an answer for life. Who's right? Who is right? You see what I'm saying? That becomes the key question. You know what my answer is? They're all right. Okay? They're all right. So therefore, if they're all right, then I'm not going to get into nobody's religious wars. Okay? I believe in all of them. All right? Now, the key point is what? If you believe in all of them, then what do you do? You do one simple thing. You do good. <laughs> you do good. You see quality. Okay? So in practicing uh, what one uh, uh, believes, essentially doing good. You can pray 50 times a day. I'm saying just do good. Do good. All right? And when you do not do good, and when you've made an error, then you have to what? Apologize. You say, I'm sorry. You say, I hope it will never happen again. But you've got to do good. And when you do good, good will come back to you. Go ahead. All right? That's key. Yeah. That's key. Right, Doing good. All right? Now I'm saying, essentially, the other side of this is that, look, all of you have got to move beyond using just 15% of your brain. Francis talk about the brain computer. I'm talking about let's move it up to 65, 75, 85%, and please don't get to 100%. We won't be able to contain you. But when you're using more of it, then you become multi-talented and multidisciplined. Let's bring me to the next point. That it is important that you create other options for yourself. As long as you are hooked into, boom, this one job, they got you. As long as you can't do anything else, you got to bend over. As long as it's, it's a, they say that Johnny knows that you got to come to work here every day, nine to five, and stay longer, he wants you to stay longer, he got you. Isn't that? 
So if we are intelligent, it gets back to that word, intelligence, it gets back to quality, that if we are intelligent, and if we are indeed the best and the brightest, then it seems to me that we create other options for ourselves all along the way, okay? So we created independent black institutions, but I've never been employed by who we created. Okay, how do I earn my living? Well, I teach at the university level. Okay, why do I go into higher education? Well, I like to teach two days a week. Okay, I teach at Tuesday and Thursday. I work four hours a day, Tuesday and Thursday. That means I got the rest of the week to do what? This or to write. Why? Because I know it's very early it was important for me to create an option. I've been working in higher education for over 20 years. And what I've seen in higher education, and then in terms of black women, at one point understand that because I taught at Howard for eight years and black women are number black men, seven to one at Howard. Okay? I teach at Chicago State University in Chicago now, and black women are number black men, four to one. Now, I'm saying at one level that we men have got to get off the stool and recognize that we cannot compete in this world, we cannot put ourselves in position or power influence unless we go through these universities. You can talk, look, can't nobody talk about the white boy like I can. But what I'm saying essentially is, and my wife says this all the time, the Japanese don't care what you call them. You can call them anything you want to call them all day long as you driving towel, driving car. <laughs> Listen to song, it don't matter. And what else? The Japanese say, whatever test you've got, bring it on. Bring it on, because I'm going to deal with it. Okay? And my point is, and what we teach <coughs> our children is, you've got an impact on life, whether the life always impacting on you. And so whatever it is, you've got to overcome it. Okay? And I'm saying, essentially, the first day of class, every semester, I tell the incoming students, look, whatever excuse you got, let's get it off your mind now, because you're not going to be able to use it after the day. I'm not buying into it. You see, I know when I had to go and earn this graduate degree in order to get a tenure position at this university I'm at now, that the only place I could go to get a degree that would be accepted at this university was in the best writing program in the country, at least while white standing, that was University of Iowa. Live in Chicago, that meant that I had to go to Iowa to work, work on this MFA. But I couldn't relocate. I got a family, we got these businesses in. So I talked to Darwin Turner in the African Studies Department and said, look, can I work in your department? I want to come here and work on this degree. Darwin said, okay. All right? Now, in doing that, it wasn't easy because for two years, among everything else that we're doing, I had to drive 500 miles a week in order to earn this MFA, plus do the work. Okay? Now, I ain't nobody extraordinary. I'm just giving you a story. I'm saying essentially that the brothers, that I'm saying if I want to get into higher education, I want to influence people at that level, and I'm going to do what I had to do to do it. Okay? And so, yes, it was difficult for two years, but two years go just like that. Right. Okay? Now, I'm saying that the sisters at some point recognize that. We can't even find anybody working in the English department in our school in Chicago State. Why? I mean, they, they don't have a PhD. Sisters have, but sisters get all kinds of good jobs in terms of higher education because there's a man out there trying to pull them in because they feel what? Race and gender. Okay? We can't find the brothers. All right. Now, let me just kind of end this up. Nine, culture and action. Ten, self-reliance ambition. Self-reliance ambition, again, building other options. Ten, creative production. Enjoy life. Do things that bring you happiness. This is so important that you have got to avoid burnout. Okay? And avoiding burnout means that you, are, you, you have hobbies. You do things that you like to do. You, 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 like I said earlier, I remain an optimist, a realistic optimist primarily because I got children. Now I look at my children sometimes and I just, you know, tears come to mind. I just love them so much. And so it becomes key that you keep that connection with the children, with the children. And 12, adapt to change. The world is a far different place than it was 100 years ago or even 50 years ago or even 30 years ago. That we have to recognize that essentially that, that among our partnerships between men and women, there's no superior, there's no inferior. Essentially what you have now, you have partnerships. And that if we are dealing with quality, quality, then essentially you share everything. You share decision making, you share a discussion, obviously your love, which brings me to the last point I want to make with you. This last point, I'm talking about serious struggle. <coughs> and I'm going to run through this because 
My time is just is up. I said that we are circles, okay? We are circles. Africa is circles. Europe represents squares and skyscrapers, you know, sc scraping the sky, okay? Now, my wife's name is Sufisha, so I took the letter S, turn it on its side, put another S on it. You got a double circle on it, all right? Oh, but also you get the, the, the sign of infinity, okay? Now, so I'm talking about infinity, so I started taking the S's and working with the S's. So I'm saying when a man and woman to move to a level of knowing, they cease to be reactive. They become proactive. And so the S's means at one point when a man and woman move to a level of love, it's actually the highest high. Okay, I'm saying when you truly love and make love, that is the high. All right. Okay. So I started using and working with these S's, and what we come up with one. I'm gonna go through this rather quickly. Source. For all people, there is a beginning, end, and renewing. You know, knowing in themselves. <coughs> Soil, life, earth. You know, land. The only thing nobody knows is making any more of. Seeing has very little to do with eyesight. Seeing is vision. You know, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder, they see, okay? Soul, the third hour of knowledge. Self, faith in oneself. It's not some European egocentric pop psychology. Self, spirit, the willingness to fly into the face of the now. You know what I'm saying? The spirit is key because that's what keeps us up and going. The <coughs> spirit. We're talking about strength. Strength is not lifting weights. But strength is being responsible in everything that we do. Structure. All people, especially children, need structure. Our children do not run our home. Our children do not run our community. But they need structure. They need security. They need essentially study. Student. Ongoing for life. A seeker of knowledge. Serious. <coughs> Approach the world in a way in which other people see that you mean business. Space, one private place for regeneration. Your home, stop time, I talked about that, regeneration. You go to your home, you come out the next day, you regenerate it, and what? You smile, you see? Smiling is so important because laughter heals. It disarms people when you smile at them. They don't know where you're coming from, okay? Because what, the blood is always angry, always angry. You know what I mean? <laughs> simplicity, <laughs> simplicity, and appreciation of the quiet, the search for quality within the notice. Silence. Quiet time, slow running to a walk, stillness, the ability to hear the heartbeat of one's future, the ability to hear the heartbeats of one's mates, one's children, solitude, aloneness. That's welcome, isolation, sharing, social network, family, children, and so forth. Saving, frugality, frugality. Now this is very important, saving. I'm saying to you, there is nothing materially that I want anymore. You know what I'm saying? You, have, you reach a saturation point. That means that my wife and I and our family, we got a house, we got a home, all right? I got a car, you know what I'm saying? It's a Toyota. I'm saying I could go out and buy a BMW tomorrow. I can get a Mercedes tomorrow. But why finish $50,000 $50, to make the Germans richer, okay? I'm saying at some point you get what you need just to keep on tracking. But if you are defined by the car you drive, the clothes you wear, the place you live, then what? If you don't have it, you have no definition. Okay? So our definitions have got to become internal and move from another level. So I'm saying at one point that we have got to move towards sharing. So therefore, the money that we have left over after we put the money aside for our children's education and our Retirement, if we retire, I don't really know. <laughs> but the point is, it goes into building independent black institutions. All right? We have got six people working in the bookstore. We got seven people working in the press. We got almost 20 people working in the school. So therefore, we got to meet a payroll every two weeks of 30 some odd people. That's serious. You see what I'm saying? That's not chump change, not to us. That's serious business. Okay? And so essentially, you have to approach it that way. Okay. All right, so sharing, saving, service, to get in one town to those less fortunate. Therefore, we are special, specialness, which means support, putting oneself in a position to offer others resources. Settle, 
set up a way of life that does not underestimate one's enemy. Stimulate the ability to pull the best from others' self and oneself. Struggle, the only way to approach life, we gotta struggle. We gotta organize, we gotta struggle. And if we organize and struggle, that means that we come out with a new shiny, having touched an internal light, which means we move toward a level of saneness, a quality of being that allows one to function intelligently under all circumstances, which means speaking, multilingual, watching one's words, skepticism, substance, which leads toward success, <coughs> which finally says that we go through all of that, then we as men will be steady and ready for sustenance. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry we're so fast, but <laughs> <laughs> we got it late and we finished late. Dr. Hockey, before we release, I have an announcement to make. We decided to express our power this morning, this, about two hours ago, by seeing how much money we could create We said we were wealthy. We got together and we created in about 10 minutes. Created $3,100. We need to give ourselves. <laughs> that's not all we created. A whole lot of people wrote some hundred dollar checks. That means we're people who are capable of writing hundred dollar checks to build black institutions. That keeps them independent. The other thing it means is that some other people put in fifty dollars. A whole lot of people put in fifty. Committed to sending the other fifty by July 30th to all. Thank you.